I'll start this part with a very brief uh, summary of the reaction of the cream of French mathematics to Fourier's manuscript uh, before I turn to s uh, uh, an overview, a very broad brush overview of the many, many applications of Fourier's ideas. Um, well, Poisson uh, wrote the summary uh, for the committee, and it was basically unenthusiastic and doubtful about the idea. Lagrange, uh, who was, uh, ag again, an absolutely eminent mathematician, not a stupid person, uh, he had very, very specific objections. They were both philosophical and calculational. And we'll talk more in a later video about exactly what seemed to be so wrong about this. But basically, he did some fairly straightforward calculations um, that seemed to make no sense at all, that seemed to make, uh, make it clear that this method couldn't possibly be correct. Um, and we'll see that those really uh, were about not understanding the fundamental nat nature of calculus than about something particularly wrong with Fourier. Um, now, nonetheless, uh, it's not that this disappeared into the mists of history uh, or that everybody ignored it just because there were objections to it. And in particular, four years later, there was a, a competition specifically about trying to analyze uh, heat flow, and Fourier won that competition, but Lagrange was still so, ob object still so opposed to, the for 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 to Fourier's ideas that he actually postponed the publication that should have resulted uh, shortly thereafter um, from winning that contest. Um, from the start, basically, it was an impressive but very dubious technique. It was beautiful if, it, if you could convince somebody it worked, if it didn't seem to have such obvious problems. It was very beautiful. Um, and it seems to work. It seemed to work physically. It seemed to actually give an answer that made sense physically. Um, so it's very like the situation in mathematical physics for the next 200 years, on and off, where someone trying to solve a physical problem comes up with something that's mathematically very dubious and yet seems to work, and it's up to other physicists or often mathematicians to try to make sense of why is this working? What's the rigorous way of expressing it? And this is still true to this day in, for example, quantum field theory. There is no really accepted, um, traditionally rigorous formulation of quantum field theory, and yet it clearly works. Um, so it's the situation that it shouldn't work, and we'll talk about why. Uh, there's specific reasons why it shouldn't work. But, or maybe it should, and it's very confusing. And the punchline really is, we'll, we'll discover in later videos, that it really made, eventually made it clear after decades that nobody really understood mathematics well enough to say for sure at that time. They just didn't realize it. Um, but this was the start. This was kind of the wedge that, that started um, a, a massive transformation. But before we get to the more pure mathematical ideas, let's look over some of the applications of the Fourier idea. The idea that you take a complicated phenomenon and express it as a sum of waves and hope that uh, the wave solutions are easy and then you can put them back in as a sum. So let's assume that Fourier was right for right now and really mostly with um, in terms of practical application he really it was right on the money. Uh, his ideas have really transformed our world and I want to show you that in various ways. Um, almost everything we do, especially has to, having to do with technology, is informed by Fourier analysis. And again, the idea is you think of everything as a sum of waves. So let's look at some of that. Let's start with heat flow, just because that's the historical first application. That's where Fourier started. Um, besides these very simple toy examples of modeling heat flow along a rod or a semi-infinite rectangular plate, what about a realistic example? Well, modeling a nuclear, nuclear reactor you definitely want to have a very accurate model of the heat flow in that reactor. You don't want to build a billion dollar reactor and then discover that it doesn't do what you think it does and have to build a new one. Once it's running, you want to be able to predict and analyze what's going on in there without sending somebody in, in there with a thermometer uh, for obvious reasons. Another example would be predicting the temperature of Ganymede's core. I think I mistakenly identified this as Europa before, but I should have realized this is Ganymede because my son did a report about building a space colony on Ganymede. That's why I picked this, this moon. So that's, one of the, that's the biggest moon of Jupiter. It's the biggest moon in the solar system. Um, and if you want to figure out what the temperature of Ganymede's core is, well, we're almost certainly never going to get to Ganymede's core. Can't even get to the middle of Earth's core, much less Ganymede. Um, if you want to be able to say something about that, you need to have a good theory of heat. If you analyze, want to analyze the heat transport in a solar flare, um, you've got to know, besides many, many other things, you've got to know how heat flows. Um, a very common place to start the story of Fourier analysis, probably more common than what I'm doing now, even though it's not historically um, accurate, is vibrations and especially sound and music. 
um, because that's something where waves are much are really very natural ways to think about things. All sound is vibration of air. Um, low tones are low frequencies. High tones are high frequencies. If you look at a pure beep tone that comes out of a computer, something that sounds very, very artificial, that's really a pure sine wave. You won't hear that coming out of a real instrument. A real instrument is a complex combination of tones, which uh, there's usually a fundamental, which is the strongest, and then overtones. And different patterns of how much overtones you get give different timbres. And I'm going to give a dynamic example in a minute. Here's an example of a readout of um, a, 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 uh, an analysis of a sound that tells you for each particular frequency that you might have how much of that is in, in, put into it. It's like, an, it's like a recipe, really. You say, let's put in a bunch of a tone that's about 1,000 hertz, uh, similar amounts of tones that are at about maybe 1,200, 1,400, 1,600. Uh, very small amounts of stuff up here, s s medium amounts of, of low tones like this, that's going to give a particular sound quality. So here's uh, an example of a, a little animation I did. Let's see if I can, it might take a couple times to get this to run. Um, might be a little loud. My apologies if the sound is on the loud side. You might want to turn it down. So the tone it started out with was a very, very artificial sounding tone. You can hear these extra waves being added in. And you can see the waveform getting more and more complicated as we add in different kinds of oscillations. So here's a particular kind, a triangle wave, which has a very particular pattern of ingredients to create it. Now I'm going to mess with it a little bit. Changing the timbre of the sound, making it more buzzy. Here's a very buzzy one. Notice how um, that uh, that square wave near the end was exactly the sound analog of. Fourier's solution for the, the simplest, what, what ought to be the simplest case for the heat problem. Uh, I'll go back to that in just a sec here. Hang on to your hats. I know it's loud. Oh, actually, I won't even play it. So here, this particular sum of a low note and a slightly higher note and a slightly higher note and a slightly higher note, this is the, are the ingredients that creates this square wave. And remember, if you just look at one little window of that, it looks like just a constant function, which is what we were trying to create in the heat case. And that sound, notice that has, that has lots of high frequency components. The reason it needs those is that um, nice, smoothly varying waves don't do this kind of thing. They don't do, sort of hang out at one constant level and then jump uh, almost to, you know, immediately up to some other level. You need a lot of sort of powerful, um, fast changing oscillations for that. That's why this actually has a very, very large high frequency components. That's why it was rather loud and annoyingly buzzy. So this is a, it's a great um, tool if you, uh, Google search for Fourier series applet, you'll probably find this thing. And you can actually just play with these sliders and produce different tones. And you're using this, these ingredients of adding more or less of low frequency waves and high frequency waves to create a particular shape. And the idea is you can create any, in principle, just about any repeating shape, any periodic function with this idea. So to continue the story of vibration, sound, and music, why would you need to know this? Well, if you want to do acoustics, you want to figure out why this concert hall is shaped in exactly the way it is, music synthesis, voice synthesis, audiology to figure out how people hear, um, anything to do with waves, uh, oscillations of, of sound waves, obviously is going to have to do with these Fourier ideas. Uh, other kinds of vibrations. Ooh, what about the stability of a structure? Uh, the famous example of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. It's very good to understand how things wave up and down in that case. Uh, seismic waves are a great example of wave behavior. Um, they come from earthquakes. Here's an example of where if an earthquake happens on one side of the world. You can analyze the seismic waves, the different kinds of oscillations on different parts of the world, and it will tell you something about the inner structure of the earth, but only if you understand wave behavior really well. And that's, again, the Fourier story. Um, a more artificial version of that is people set off uh, small earthquakes, tiny little explosions, near uh, a uh, some place that they think has oil or gas and measure the seismic waves bouncing off of that to get an idea of what's underneath. Again, you're going to have to understand wave behavior. Other kinds of vibrations, waves, 
radio waves, TV, light, anything to do with electromagnetic wa magnetic waves. Um, we use that, of course, for communication, for um, just between you and your neighbor or between us and the deep space satellites or understanding um, waves that are coming down, you know, coming from distant quasars, for example. A great example of, of the very precise use of these, these Fourier ideas is this is a picture of a part of the VLA, the Very Large Array, in my home state of New Mexico. And the reason you have all these telescopes next to each other is that if you do it correctly, um, you can take the signal from all these telescopes and put them together to synthesize a signal as if they were part of a much bigger radio dish. Now, a radio dish which may, with many gaps in it, so it doesn't have necessarily as much collecting power as um, a, a huge dish of this size, putting them together. But the resolving power, the, the ability to resolve a, uh, two objects in the sky that are very, very close to each other in, in, in their apparent position in the sky, that actually depends just on how big this virtual aperture is. And to combine those correctly, you have to know a lot about very, very precise ways to combine waves together. That's the Fourier idea. Uh, a similar idea in terms of creating signals, not just analyzing signals from distant galaxies, is multiplexing. This fiber, this uh, this core, this cable here, is a bunch of optical fibers, and it's clear from the number of little fibers in here that you could carry on many conversations at once using this fiber. But you can actually carry on many more conversations at once than you might think, because each particular little thread of glass can actually hold, make, carry on many, many conversations through the miracle of multiplexing which is to take a bunch of different signals and combine them um, essentially at, at different frequencies or different patterns. And you cannot do that. You can't make any sense of that unless you know about the Fourier idea of creating complicated things out of sums of simple waves. Um, another great example that I was just reading about recently is uh, radar and remote sensing and uh, a version of radar called, called LIDAR where they fly over um, the jungles of Honduras or other places in Central America and they shoot radar beams uh, and bounce them off the, the terrain below and they can detect um, th things like ancient Mayan, Mayan ruins through the trees. How do you do that through the trees? Well you have to know um, how to sort of subtract the trees out or have to, how to see through that um, in terms of the waves that are bouncing back. Another very sophisticated um, application of these ideas. Medical imaging, a very um, crucial thing in, you know, in our modern world, modern medicine. Um, we need to be able to look inside, like here's a picture of, uh, of, of a brain in action, um, looking at different areas using different amounts of, of, of energy, basically trying to giving a, a picture of a brain thinking. Um, those also use these kinds of ideas in a, in a very deep way. So one thing you uh, could notice about all my examples so far is that they're all analog behavior. Um, these are all waves in the sort of traditional sense of continuously varying uh, fields of pressure uh, for sound or height for the radar example for seeing Mayan ruins or electromagnetic fields. They're all things that vary continuously. But um, our world, our technological world is much more digital than it ever was. And so the question is, maybe the digital world is make, making these Fourier ideas um, less and less important than they used to be. Well, no, that's not true. Absolutely not true. Um, for there's very important dis discrete forms of the Fourier idea. Um, and they're behind the ideas of how MP3s work, uh, JPEG for, for uh, still, still pictures, MPEG for motion pictures. They're all based on Fourier ideas. So here's an example. You, we want to create, we want to take this image and we want to compress it. We want to make um, a JPEG version of this. In fact, it is a JPEG on my computer. Um, the, pr the reason for that is that if you just encode it as a single value, like a grayscale value for every pixel, that's actually quite wasteful and much uh, bigger than you need. And the basic idea is you look at all the different kinds of discrete versions of wave behavior. Here's an incredibly low frequency kind of wave. It doesn't vary at all. Here's a much more high frequency kind of wave. It varies from black to white quite a bit in one little, little square. And then here's things that are in between varying from black to white less with less frequency than this guy. Well, the JPEG idea basically takes this picture and synthesizes it as sums of these guys. So for example, the one in the middle is only using some of the low frequency components. You can get the basic idea, but it looks blurry. 
uh, and it has a lot of artifacts, and that's because it hasn't used the high frequency components yet. So it's rather like um, in the animations I show, showed before in the heat problem, where we had something that was sort of trying to look like the constant function, but was still inaccurately wiggly. Um, that's the analog of, of this middle stage. When you include all the high frequency components, you get back this thing, but w still with a significant savings in terms of data compression. Um, so all of these guys are based, all these digital ideas are based on the Fourier idea, just done in a discrete fashion. In fact, um, in the 60s, there was a, a big revolution in discrete mathematics exactly around the Fourier idea that people figured out that not only can you do a discrete Fourier transform, that was known um, for you know, decades before that, but there's a particularly fast way to do it, um, which has been called the most important numerical algorithm of our lifetime, um, assuming you were alive in the 60s, um, but really of, of the 20th century perhaps. Um, Gau it turns out if you look at unpublished notebooks of Gauss from 1805, he actually had the basic idea of this, which is truly amazing. But it never really had a, a, a killer app until computers became uh, fast enough and applications became intense enough so that you wanted to be able to do a pretty massive discrete Fourier transform quickly. And Cooley and Tukey uh, get the credit for rediscovering this for about the third or fourth time perhaps, but finally really popularizing it. and and showing that this was a, a crucial algorithm for, for modern computing. Uh, the problems, even in the 60s, um, the speed up that this algorithm created was a speed up of a factor of like 800,000 or more. And nowadays, you could find examples where the speed up is, is factors of billions, where you just couldn't do a calculation without this technique of the fast Fourier. It's called the fast Fourier transform. Um, but you can with this idea. I'm not going to go into the details of, of, uh, of how the fast Fourier works. But it's basically, these are kind of schematic pictures of taking a bunch of data and organizing them in a, in a very efficient way. Um, also uses complex numbers in a very beautiful way. Um, the, one of the cool things about the Fast Fourier Transform is it's so quick, you, can, you use it to do things that you might think you wouldn't have to use any sophisticated technique at all. For example, uh, to multiply these two numbers together, uh, this like, I don't know, it's about 100 digits times this is about 60 digits. Uh, it's actually faster for a computer to take this number, put it in binary, analyze it with a Fourier transform, kind of look at it as a sum of, of oscillations, do the same with this number, put them together uh, and in a certain way, not multiplying them, uh, doing something else to them, and then transforming them back. That seems like an absurdly complicated way to just multiply two numbers. But if you think about it, if you try to do th this multiplication by hand, it really would take an incredible amount of time. There's a lot of computer operations that would do it, that you'd have to do to do this um, the straightforward way. And if these numbers are thousands of digits, then it's really, really nice. It's a mag major speed up to multiply two large numbers. So why on earth would you ever want to multiply these two large numbers? Well, encryption is a, an incredibly important reason for that. Modern encryption schemes use uh, factoring and multiplication and other basic arithmetic operations on very large numbers to keep like things like internet commerce secure. Um, and um, so you want very, very fast, efficient ways to do this. So part of what's going on there when you do your credit card is most probably a fast Fourier transform. Um, and I'll mention that uh, many encryption schemes use much more sophisticated versions of Fourier ideas. I'm not, I can't even touch in this talk how deeply embedded Fourier style ideas are in some very, very sophisticated branches of mathematics. Um, I'm going to stop here because it's getting pretty long. Um, we'll do a little bit more applications in the next part and then turn back to why do I claim this was the edge of the wedge for a revolution in mathematics.